So, very early in my life, I realized that I'm a nerd. As back in 1989, at high school, I wrote a paper about artificial intelligence. And I wrote how AI could help us to make better informed decisions. And how AI could help nurses and caregivers in Africa to become something what I called super doctors. And my teacher really understood me as he gave me an F. Um, which gave me the feeling that I should never touch on that topic again, which is the reason why I didn't study computer science, and I started studying dental medicine, and I followed that with physiotherapy. Um, now, fast forwarding 20 years, after having spent 10 years in the corporate world as a manager, focusing on following my geekiness, uh, combining this with my medical background, um, AI just woke up, and what I noticed that all the passion that I had that I wrote in that paper and all the hopes that I had all came back. And my childhood hopes that AI could help these workers and these community workers in Africa to become some kind of super doctors came back. But it took me 10 other years to understand that I was working in the wrong corporate structure or in the wrong organization to build medical AI on. As if AI is going to be here to serve us in all our healthcare needs, then AI should be owned by us and not by a corporate structure that first has to serve their shareholders as to serve their patients. And it should not be owned by an organization close to the government as it will then serve first serve political interest and then patients' interest. So going a bit more back into time, in 1996, I was in Switzerland working as a physiotherapist with injured athletes, and that's where I discovered the internet. Um, I suddenly had access to medical papers, and I, had, I was empowered to discuss cases with physicians, and I knew more about these cases than they did, as I was having access to the latest papers. But then I realized that the latest research was not applied and these patients were not treated according to the latest standards. And I believed that the internet could solve this, and I believed that the all-gifted internet would quickly become something as the greatest invention that humankind made. But today, 20 years later, half of the world population still doesn't have access to healthcare services. It would take a country such as Nigeria 300 years to get on the same level as we have on numbers of physicians per capita. And in the Western world, millions of people are being pushed into poverty because of their healthcare expenses. Inequalities in healthcare are systematic differences in health status between different population groups. And these population groups can be within the same country. So based on your social conditions, where you are born, where you grew up, where you get your education, where you live, where you work, where you age, which people you are connected to, and perhaps your religion, that forbids you to take a vaccination. Your health status might be very, very different. And according to Hippocrates, who was the godfather of medicine, such a society where inequalities in healthcare exist is a society that is fragmented and mechanical. And one of the biggest variables in healthcare needs is the outcome of the decisions we make. So if we want to understand inequalities, we first have to understand how people make decisions for their healthcare needs, but as well these nurses. And one of my current favorite authors is the work of Daniel Kahneman, who is a Nobel Prize laureate and a psychologist and an economist. And he talks about that humans use two kinds of systems to take decisions. The first system is quick, it's intuitive, and it doesn't need a lot of effort. The second one is analytical, goes slow, and needs a lot of effort. I'll give you two examples. You're sitting in a car, driving with your partner, having a really intense discussion, and you need to park your car in a big parking lot with no traffic. You probably can do both things at the same time. But if you're going to do this driving backwards on a, on a busy street, and you have to go into that little parking lot, you probably will interrupt that conversation. 
that's highly analytical, and that's why you can't do that. So that's system two thinking. And now people might think that healthcare is all about system two thinking, very analytical, a lot of effort needed, but this is not the case. Most of the decisions physicians take is based on system one thinking. It's based on intuition, and it includes bias. One of the most important, though, um, the greatest bias that we see in healthcare is overconfidence. And overconfidence is nearly endemic in healthcare. And there is a research paper that looked at how confident are these physicians when they take their diagnosis and compared that with the results of the biopsy when the patient died. And in 40% of the cases, these overconfident physicians were wrong. And this is based because they take decisions based on intuition and system one thinking. So when I was talking to a physician why we needed machines in healthcare, they said to me like, well, you know, medicine, it is not a science, it is an art. And but then intuition is actually pattern recognition, and it gets better over time with you have, when you have experience. So while diagnosing physicians, physicians use senses. They use their eyes, they use their touch, uh, they hear what the patient has to say, and they even use their nose. And back in the time when a physician saw a patient, when they didn't have any analytical tools, when a patient smelled like fish, he probably had a kidney failure. And when the patient smelled like nail polish remover, he probably had diabetes. And when the patient smelled like the butcher shop, he probably had yellow fever. I can only smell if somebody has a hangover. <laughs> Today we have modern analytical tools that extend our senses. We use microscope to look into, um, uh, to extend our eyesight. And we use x-rays to look into our bodies. And we use biochemical analysis to look into our blood. Through open science, we created technology, and technology helped us to overcome our human limitations. Take the work of a pathologist, for example. I don't know if there's any pathologist in the room, and I hope I don't insult any, but part of his job is looking at biopsy samples out of the microscope and analyzing if the samples are cancerous or not. And he uses his eyes for that and his brain to process that information and look for patterns. So in my quest to understand how physicians or humans take decisions, I ask myself, is this intuitive thinking of pattern recognition exclusive to humans? And I found out that birds, and it was said before, they see way more light waves and have a better eyesight. So we could ask ourselves the questions, do birds, can they be trained to become better pathologists? And I found this research paper where actually they trained pigeons to become pathologists. <laughs> and these pigeons were watching these images, and after two weeks of training, they got as good as the average pathologist. <laughs> and if they had 16 pigeons looking at the same images in parallel, they got to 99% accuracy, which is amazing. But nobody is talking that these pigeons are taking our jobs away. <laughs> Media is constantly reporting that AI will take all our jobs away. But they don't report that pigeons who can do exactly the same thing and better than humans will take these jobs away. So AI is, can do great things, but it doesn't want to do great things. In fact, it doesn't want anything. It's the people who put AI into our society that define the purpose of what we should use it for. And we are still far away from super intelligence, which is that more intelligence all the humans on this planet. But the progress that we are witnessing is of unseen speed. Futurists talk about exponentials, as we heard before as all the technologies that underlie and are needed for AI development are growing exponentially in their capacity. And we see most progress in what we call deep learning, which is a pattern recognition technique, which is very similar to system one thinking, just better, as these machines can perform better. 
These AI systems today are already overperforming on the diagnostics in certain areas. And if designed well and there is no bias in the data, we can scale this in each single corner of this planet. Eventually, these intelligent machines could develop to some kind of super medical intelligence, which is smarter than all the physicians that are on this planet and could become the fundament of our future healthcare systems. So we finally created a technology that allows us to solve inequalities in healthcare. Finally, the dream that I wrote in 1989 about that physicians in Africa could become these super doctors could become true. This is amazing. But there is one big problem. The vast majority of the investments done in AI are coming from the private industry. The US and China are going for AI supremacy, and the values of these regions are very different to the values that we know in Europe that are correlated with our healthcare systems. So both regions are heading to oligopolies, where a few platforms at the end will own our future medical knowledge. And we know this. There is a company in Europe that has 92% market share when we go and search something on the internet. They know more about you than you know about yourself. And from a patient perspective, or from a citizen perspective, it feels like the current development of AI is happening to us, as opposed to be developed in partnership with us. And it's this happening to us that I find particularly a problem. Uh, as in a recent case, that we saw that an all-male group in the US decided that abortion should be abandoned. Nobody should decide in that sense what medical AI has as a purpose. We should that, do that. And we should ask ourselves one single question. What can we all together do so we and our children can benefit most from AI in medicine and while decreasing these inequalities? So for the last couple of years, I've been asking that question. And I've been discussing this with researchers, investors. I even went up as high as the European Commission. And although amazing work has been done on ethics, there is still one problem. Nobody could give me the answer who is going to own that medical knowledge in the future. And I think it's completely reckless to start developing AI without solving that answer for us, who is going to own this. And perhaps I might be very skeptical, but having worked nearly 20 years in a corporate structure and living in a world where Novartis just launched a medication for a rare childhood disease and it cost 2.2 million US dollars for that treatment, living in a world where a hedge fund manager bought an HIV therapy and increased the price by 56 or factor of 56, yes, I am skeptical when it comes about ownership of knowledge in healthcare. And I think we have to seriously rethink on which foundation we're going to build these systems on. And from my perspective, this needs to be based on the same foundation that Hippocrates laid 2,500 years ago, a foundation of altruism. So we can use AI and science to further progress um, society and decrease inequalities. But to accomplish this, knowledge needs to be open. Knowledge should liberate us, and it should not oppress us. Otherwise, we might just turn back to the pre-Gutenberg era. We invented the printing press, where at the time, a single organization defined what was disease. It was a force of the creator that we needed to serve, and we had to pay for our sins. Progress is not inevitable, and it's not a magic source or comes from some mysterious force. It is the result of a fruit of system of beliefs and values that many of all of you share without even realizing it. We lost the sense of what power could do as the economic and the political organizations we work for are being built on self-interest and not on altruism. Our hopes for a better future, they cannot be found. They have to be built. It took us 130 years to build the Sagrada Familia in Spain. It probably takes us only half of the time to build that super medical intelligence that can serve a whole world population. This is why I started a mission to change the current progress. And I founded an NGO that focuses on open sourcing medical AI and hack 
the current development with the same principles that destroyed the monopoly of Microsoft back in the 90s. A CIMA foundation as a combination of an open source foundation and a humanitarian organization. We will collect donations, we will open up data for researchers and serve a community that we all together can build medical AI as a public good and that can serve us and build a different future. A future where AI first is serving us and then other interests. A foundation that allows an African entrepreneur to access trained AI models and build his own AI doctors. And as mentioned in my school paper, as well support his community workers to become super doctors. So today we stand for the choice or we become the dumbest generation since the invention, invention of the printing press that reverses public access to medical knowledge. Or we use the superpower of human collaboration, shared values and beliefs to build medical AI as a public good. And believe me, this is the only foundation that will further solve and decrease the inequalities in health and inequalities in length of life. Thank you for your attention.